According to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. You may be seated. Well, my name again is Jerry Riando. I am married to my wife, Catherine. We've been married for uh, about 10 years now, 10 years in August. And so we moved here uh, about a year ago with our family. We have three children. Virginia is turning seven tomorrow. My little girl, Alice, is somewhere in this room over there. You can say hi to her at some point. She is five and adorable. And I have a little boy named Jerry, uh, not Jerry Jr., Jerry Jr. is my dad. Uh, this is Jerry the fourth, uh, my son. Uh, they are worshiping this morning at uh, Redeemer Presbyterian Church in Midtown Detroit, who sends their greetings uh, to you here in uh, Farmington Hills. And we are, uh, I'm so excited to have the opportunity to be here and share God's word with you. Just as a brief introduction of, of who I am and, and the work that my family and I, I are doing. Uh, again, we moved here about a year ago with the, the hope, the dream, the prayer of seeing a gospel preaching reformed church uh, planted in the city of Dearborn. You all may uh, be familiar with Dearborn to various level, levels. It is a fascinating city. It's a city of about 120,000 people. Uh, it's a college town. There's actually 30,000 students who attend college in the city of Dearborn. Uh, it's the largest concentration of Arab uh, men and women uh, from anywhere outside of the Middle East. And it is, of course, uh, a corporate home for uh, a number of companies, most importantly, Ford. And so there's many populations there. Uh, it's a very uh, influential uh, community in, in many different uh, parts of culture. And uh, there is a very unfortunate, uh, uh, unfortunately small number of gospel preaching churches in the community. There are gospel preaching churches that are doing wonderful work. But the unfortunate reality is that most people in Dearborn, most of those who live in our neighborhoods or who attend college in our universities or work in our, our, our office buildings, most of them will probably live their entire lives and never hear the gospel from another human being. In a sense, in Dearborn, the gospel has become very avoidable. And we dream of a day working side by side with many, many other churches and ministries, a day when the gospel becomes unavoidable, where it would be very difficult to attend college in Dearborn or live in our neighborhoods and not encounter Jesus, not be told the good news of Jesus by someone who you have a relationship with. And in partnership with other churches around the city. We dream the same for the whole area of Metro Detroit. Uh, we love the idea of working together with churches like you all and other faithful churches uh, to continue to see gospel preaching churches planted around the city, dreaming of a day where the gospel would be unavoidable in all of Metro Detroit. Uh, where well, you'd have to encounter the gospel if you lived here or worked here. Um, we are near the beginning of our work. We've been meeting uh, with info meetings and Bible studies in our home, but just last Sunday... Uh, we had our first launch team meeting for this new church, which is hopefully going to be called Grace Presbyterian Church of Dearborn. And uh, we're having our second launch team meeting today. This is a group of people we're gathering to pray and plan for a future uh, public worship launch sometime in the future. And so if you could be praying for us and the work we're undertaking, we'd, we'd really appreciate that. If as you're hearing me, me share, you think, oh, there's someone who I know who lives in that area who Jerry should definitely get connected to, I would love to be connected to, uh, and we, we, we look forward to partnering with you. I'll share one brief story of our work before we, we look at the sermon text. Uh, early on in my time in Dearborn, uh, just a couple months after I moved, we've been here about a year, uh, I was at the campus of University of Michigan at Dearborn, and there were um, uh, two young men who looked very similar. They turned out to be twins, were actually two of triplets. And I sat down next to them and introduced myself and asked if we could just chat for a little bit. And uh, they said yes. Uh, their names were Hattie and um, I forget the other, one of the other of the, the triplets. Uh, one of his brothers was there as well. 
And I asked if, you know, we, and they're from Lebanon. They just moved here. They're 18 year old freshmen attending college. And I asked if we could just talk a little bit about what they believed about, about God, about religion. They said yes, and they shared quite a bit. And they shared the, the very typical phrase that, um, that many young Muslims will share when I talk to them. And they said, you know, Christianity, Islam, we basically believe the same thing. We're, we worship the same God. We're, we're try, our, we're all, we're, we have the same goals. And I, I asked, what is that same goal? What is the same purpose? What is that thing that you believe that we both have in common, that we're both working toward? And Hadi answered, well, you know, we want to get to heaven. And we want to honor God. And we want to do good things to, to get to heaven. And I said, well, what if I told you that that's actually not what Christianity is all about? And I did my best to share the gospel with him. And afterward, Hadi says, wait, wait. So you're telling me that Christians don't do good things to get into heaven? They do good things because they're grateful they're already going to heaven because of Jesus? And I said, yes, exactly. That's right. You totally get it. And he pauses and kind of thinks for a second and then says, wow, that sounds way better. And it was this, this beautiful moment of, he didn't believe the gospel yet, but he saw the gospel message as beautiful. And he, he, didn't, he hasn't yet come to believe it's true, but he saw it as beautiful. And I think that's a really important first step. And I'll fast forward a couple months. I was meeting with him again. We met regularly. And his brother, Ali, was there. And Ali, uh, it was one of the first times I spent time talking to him about faith. And he shared basically the same thing his brother had shared about Christianity and Islam being basically about the same thing. And Hattie goes, no, no, no. You don't understand Christianity. And he looks at me and says, can I tell him what you all believe? I said, please. And he shares the gospel with his brother. So he, neither have yet come to trust in Christ, but I'm trusting that as they see the gospel is beautiful, they will someday come to trust him. So you can pray for our work. Uh, we're very excited about it. So going to our, our sermon text this morning, we're looking at really the second chunk of the chapter one of, of the book of Ephesians. And in the first section that we did not read this morning, Paul has just told the Ephesians something remarkable. He has told them that they are adopted sons and daughters of God. Adopted sons and daughters of God. And in this passage, he begins to work out some of the implications of that reality. Before I went into church planning, I worked with college students for 13 years, so you'll hear me share some, some college student stories. But I, I, I think sometimes when we talk about uh, uh, saying, you know, I could, you could sometimes sentimentalize this idea of uh, loving someone like a son. I might say to college students I work like, oh, I love you like a, a son, meaning I have great affection for you, but I'm older than you. So it's, you know, it's kind of like a father-son relationship. But what I don't mean when I say that to a college student is, I'm going to start paying your college tuition, <laughs> right? I don't mean that. It's just an expression of sentimentality. But here, Paul is not doing that. He's saying, you are God's sons and daughters, and it is far more than sentiment. It is, there, it is, there are real implications here. And one of the implications that he expresses here is that you have an inheritance, like a, a, like a son and daughter should have, you have an inheritance. And of course, when you find out you have an inheritance, it's good news in relationship to how wealthy the person who you're getting inheritance from is. And God being the most wealthy of any being in the universe, this is really fantastic news. And it should make us ask the question right away, what is the inheritance? And Paul, in typical Paul fashion, doesn't tell us at all what the inheritance is here. Uh, Because his point in this passage isn't what is the inheritance, but the fact that you have an inheritance, which is an affirmation of the reality that you are indeed truly sons and daughters of God, legally speaking. But fortunately, in some other passages, Paul does tell us a little bit about this inheritance. For instance, in Romans 8, 17, Paul writes this, and if children, meaning since you are children of God, then heirs, heirs of God, and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order, and here's the key, that we may also be glorified with him. Glorified with him. A part of our inheritance has to do with God's glory. There's some mysterious sense in which we, as God's children, if we have trusted in Christ, share God's glory. 
This word glory is a very positive sounding word, but I feel like it's one of those words that's kind of in the air. It's hard to grasp and really put your finger on what is glory. What does it mean that I get glory? I think we can maybe think of moments in our life where we see glimpses of glorious things. I think of the, the, the birth of my first child. And that first time I saw a human being who uh, didn't used to exist and now exists. And it's like half me and half my wife. And it's amazing and glorious and this miracle. And it was a glorious moment, right? Or maybe there's been a time in your life where you have been recognized for something or achieved something and you have receive some level of glory. Maybe you won a sporting event or you're given an award and there's this sense of of glory, of recognition. And it's this small glimpse of maybe what glory is. Uh, There's a great theological dictionary that defines glory this way. Glory is beauty, power, or honor. It's a quality of God that emphasizes his greatness and authority as well as moral beauty and perfection. Let me read that again. It is beauty, power, or honor, a quality of God that emphasizes his greatness and authority, as well as moral beauty and perfection. And part of our inheritance from God is God sharing that with us. His beauty, his power, his honor, his moral beauty and perfection. He shares that with us. And how does he share it with us? Well, through the gospel. You... If you are a follower of Jesus, we'll get credit for everything Jesus did and everything Jesus is. And Jesus is glorious. You are going to be treated for all eternity as if you were Jesus. As if you were God's only begotten son in one sense. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, we're told that we will actually, because of the sharing in glory and sharing in Christ's reputation and what he has earned, we will rule and reign with Christ. What does that actually mean? How, what is that, how is that going to play out? What does it mean to share in another's glory? Um, well, again, I, I moved to Detroit about a year ago. And um, I, I, for some reason, I have a, a passion for cheering for sports teams that continually let me down. And so I decided to become a Lions fan, and I went to my first Lions game. It was week two of the season, and it was a great week. Uh, The Lions played fantastic. They played against uh, the Washington Commanders, and they won the game. And at the end of the game, it was almost a crowd was losing their minds. They were so excited that their team had won. People were hugging each other. I saw people crying, right? They were celebrating. It was this glorious moment. But the funny thing is... These fans hadn't done anything worthy of celebrating. They'd just been sitting and eating overpriced food, right? Like, they had, we hadn't done anything to deserve the glory that we were sharing. And the Lions on the field, to some extent, had earned some measure of glory. Now, they'd only beaten the commander, so it was only a limited amount of glory. But there was some glory there, but we hadn't done anything. We were just in the stands. But that's what sporting, cheering for sporting is like. It's vicarious. You share in the glory of what your team does in the field. And you share in the shame when they do poorly as well. And that's a tiny glimpse of what it means to share in Christ's glory. But it's more than that. It'd be more like if I got to go down the field after the game and got picked up like in the movie Rudy and carried around like I'd caught the winning touchdown, even though all I'd done was sit in the stands. And even more than that, it'd be like if I went home and I checked my mailbox and there was a Detroit Lions paycheck sitting there, as, as if I got paid for doing what they did on the field. That's what it means to share in another's glory, to some small sense. And, and, and here's the crazy thing. Verse 11 tells us that you have already obtained this glorious inheritance from Christ. You already have it. You already have it. But, and this is the first of three very brief points, Our inheritance comes with some early withdrawal restrictions. It comes with some early withdrawal restrictions. Because in verse 14, Paul tells us something very confusing. In verse 11, he says, you have already obtained this inheritance. But in verse 14, he says, you have yet to acquire possession of that inheritance. 
So which is it, Paul? Have I already obtained it, or have I yet to acquire possession of it? And in typical infuriating fashion when it comes to Paul and much of the scriptures, the answer to these conundrums is yes. It's both A and B. You, you, have, you, you, have, you have received it, and you have yet to fully come into possession of it. We live in this already, but not yet. We already have our inheritance, but we have not yet fully acquired possession of it. There was a student who I I worked with at uh, James Madison University, one of the schools I did college ministry at, whose name was Hunter. And Hunter, to me, epitomized the poor college student, like, um, just lifestyle. He lived with, like, 11 roommates, just way too many roommates because he couldn't afford to live by himself. He ate chiefly ramen noodles and spent no money on himself. He didn't have, um, he didn't have any, any budget for any of these things, and uh, we met regularly throughout his time at, at, at college, and near the end of our time together, I learned something very surprising about Hunter. Hunter was pretty wealthy. It was very surprising. See, his grandfather had sadly passed away and left him a very large inheritance. Hunter had a great deal more money than I did. Now, I was in college ministry, so it doesn't say a lot, but still, I didn't have to live with 11 roommates, right? And so my, my situation appeared to be better on the surface, So Hunter was very wealthy, but the inheritance he had received had a restriction on it. He wasn't allowed to access it until he turned 25. So in one sense, he had acquired, he had had already received the inheritance. He could go online to the bank account, and it was in his name, he could see the balance. But in another very real way, he had yet to acquire possession of it. It couldn't actually benefit his financial situation today. And that's a little bit like what our inheritance with Christ is. There is, in a sense, an early withdrawal restriction. And because of this, we need to guard against an error. And I'm going to use a a theological phrase here, but don't worry, I will explain it. We need to guard against what can be called an over-realized eschatology. An over-realized eschatology. Well, what is an over-realized eschatology? What's eschatology? Well, eschatology, very helpfully, is the study of the eschaton, which... Isn't all that helpful. What is the eschaton? The eschaton is the, the end time. The, 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 the last era in human or in any kind of history is the eschaton. It's going to be when Jesus returns and all eternity after that. So there's going to be this period of time that goes forever called the eschaton. And there's certain promises that God has made up for us as his followers that we will receive in the eschaton. And over-realized eschatology is taking those promises that are promised for the future and trying to apply them today, right? And so this, for Hunter, what that would have looked like is if Hunter, before he turned 25, had gone out and bought a brand new F-150. He would have said, I have the money, I can pay for it, but that was a promise for him after 25, So if he tries to buy it when he's 22, he's going to realize when the first payment is due, he can't actually make the payment. And so, what does this look like spiritually for our inheritance with God? Well, there was a a young lady, um, we'll call her Susan for this story, at the University of Michigan at Dearborn, who I've gotten to know a little bit, and has been a part of our our launch team in Dearborn, but there was this one, and she's very new to the Christian faith, and there was this, there was this one day, I was sitting on campus with a couple of students, and she came up to us who were sitting down and talking, and she just looked so distraught. So distraught. And we asked her, what's, what's going on, Susan? And she says, uh, and she told this sort of horror story that I think for many college students is like their worst, absolute worst nightmare. She was in a public speaking class, which for some people is just, it's the worst thing they could imagine. Public speaking class, she had to give this presentation, and it was literally the worst story I've ever heard of someone trying to give a presentation. She was so nervous, she got to the front of the room and she was able to say one word in the presentation, then burst into tears and like ran off the the stage. Just absolute disaster. And she was so ashamed. She was so ashamed. She felt so bad. She was just crushed. And one of the students I was with said to Mary, hey Mary, can I pray for you? And Mary said, no. We said, well, why not? And she said something very telling, something very thoughtful. She said, God didn't help me. Think about her logic for a second there. She is new to the faith, and she's been told there is this God who loves her dearly. 
and who is all-powerful, and yet she has just experienced something, and a God who's promised her this glorious inheritance, but she has just experienced something that's decidedly not glorious, the exact opposite of glory, and she's now thinking to herself, either this God is not, doesn't really love me the way you said he loves me, he doesn't offer the promises you say he offers me, or he's not powerful. Whatever it is, there's really no use in you praying to him for me. Because he didn't help me in that situation. And I bet that all of us in this room can think of a, a scenario or a situation in our life where we've thought the same thing. God can't possibly love me or truly offer me the promises of Scripture or truly be powerful because of the th- this thing that happened in my life, life of someone I know. Because if he was those things, those wouldn't have happened. And though that pain is very legitimate and very real, there's a flaw in the logic. You see, Mary had no... She was right. There is glory for her promised in the eschaton. But she was expecting to receive that fully now. And when she didn't receive it fully now, she assumed that meant that God didn't love her. But this passage tells us so many ways that God does love us. God chose us. This passage says he predestined us. Christ died for us. He has won great blessings for us. But blessings that may not be fully realized in this life. And if we measure God's love for us solely on our experience today, we will err. We need to remember, point one, that our inheritance has an early withdrawal restriction. Point two, our inheritance, this is sort of the opposite point. Our inheritance, though it has an early withdrawal restriction, does have a first installment. There's an early installment that we have already received. So we're talking about this error of this over-realized eschatology, There's an opposite error. There's always an opposite ditch. And for the sake of parallelism, I'm going to call this an under-realized eschatology. That's not not a phrase. But I'm going to call it an under-realized eschatology versus an over-realized eschatology. And this is the, the assumption that there are absolutely no benefits to being a follower of Jesus today. And so maybe you have sat under preaching at some point in your life, somewhere you visited, that makes the Christian life sound a little bit like this. You're not promised anything in this life, so go live your miserable little life, die, and then you'll get to enjoy heaven. I've sat under preaching like that makes me expect absolutely nothing good from Christ in this life. And if there are traditions that may fall into this era over here of an overrealized eschatology, I think our shared tradition in the Presbyterian world might fall, might be more apt to fall into this era where we expect nothing from God in this life. But this passage tells us we have been given something absolutely remarkable, and that is the Holy Spirit who dwells in us. In verse 13 and 14, we're, we're told about the Holy Spirit, and there's two words in verse 13 and 14 that Paul uses. One is seal and guarantee. The Holy Spirit is our seal, and he is our guarantee. What is a seal? Well, so in the first century, there was no two-step authentication to make sure your communications were always from the person who they seemed to be from. And so uh, a seal, if you were an important person and you needed people to know a piece of communication was from you, was a, a special symbol or emblem that you, you either wore in a ring or maybe around your neck, that when you sent a letter and you poured wax to seal it, you'd press that symbol into the wax. So whoever received the letter, if that seal wasn't broken, would know the letter was authentic. And so, if you are a follower of Jesus, the Holy Spirit has been given to you. In a sense, God has pressed his image, his mark of ownership on you. And you will, therefore, be received with certainty into heaven. Because you have the seal of the Holy Spirit. He is securing your safe arrival. The Holy Spirit, in verse 14, is called our guarantee. So, of course, the book of Ephesians, like the rest of the New Testament, was originally written in Greek. The word translated guarantee is not originally a Greek word. It came into Greek via the Phoenician language. The Phoenicians were famously traitors. Traitors, people who traded things, not traitors. Um, And this this is an economic term. It means a partial payment or a down payment. In a sense, the Holy Spirit is God's down payment of his inheritance to you in your life today. And we experience some of the benefits. What are those benefits? Well, for one thing, you have already, if you are a follower of Jesus, you have already, in the past tense, been justified. God has already declared you to be perfectly 
righteous, to be without fault in his eyes. And he has promised to treat you that way for all eternity. God already loves you as if you had received all the glory that you're going to receive from Jesus at the end of time. As if you were already perfectly beautiful, powerful, morally perfect. He already loves you that way. Completely. When the eyes of God are on you, he is delighted in you because you have been justified. You are being sanctified. This means you are being made righteous. God is not leaving you as you are. If you are experiencing a sense of desperation in your sin, and you think, I will never, ever improve. I'm hopeless. Well, then you're not actually believing that the Holy Spirit is in you and will not leave you without effect. And God, though we will not see the full growth and righteousness and perfection in this life, he will bring it to us at the end of time. And this can affect our lives today. Hunter, my student, my poor student, he didn't have any money well, that he could spend. He had lots of money. He didn't have any money he could spend. But he was never stressed about money. Like so many of the students I worked with were stressed about money. There was no sense of despair for him because he knew there was no permanency to his poverty. He knew the money was coming, and so he didn't let his current situation stress him as much as it could have. In other words, he didn't suffer from an underrealized eschatology. What does it look like if we suffer from an underrealized eschatology? Do you live a life marked significantly by feelings of shame, guilt, unworthiness? Or are you convinced that you're not loved or not lovable, that you're not worthy, that you're not significant? Or, for, and out of a fear of one of those things being true, have you dedicated your life to proving your value and worth on your own? Do you labor constantly to make sure a day never comes when someone find, would say to you, you're not worth it, you didn't measure up? Well, here's the reality, brothers and sisters. You have been justified. God has already given you all the worth, all the value, all the significance for all eternity that you could ever hope for. And if we find ourselves sitting in those feelings without preaching the gospel to ourselves, we're living in an underrealized eschatology. Or how about this? Do you feel a sense of hopelessness? Do you say, I will never, ever, ever grow as a Christian? I have no power. Well, then you may be experiencing an underrealized eschatology. You may not really be believing that the Holy Spirit is in you as a down payment and that God is working in you, even in ways you can't see. Before I move on to the last and much briefer point, uh, a little interesting side note here. This word guarantee, which is the word that is used to describe what the Holy Spirit is for us, that came from the Phoenician language, it's still in modern Greek. Modern Greek is much different than the Koine Greek the New Testament was written in. But this word still here, though it has shifted in meaning, that word now means engagement ring. Isn't that a cool picture of a first installment of a future promise? Isn't that a cool picture? So my wife, when we were dating, we dated long distance, and we dated for a long time, about 20 months. And at some point in that process, my wife began to ask herself, is this guy ever going to propose? And we were on the phone, it was, we were long distance, and we got in this horrible fight one night, the worst fight we ever had as a dating couple. And we, neither of us remember what it was about. But we remember that at the, the, at the bottom of it, the core of it, the, the, the cause of it was a feeling of insecurity in where we were going in our relationship. Was I really committed? During this conversation, I was holding Catherine's engagement ring. I had just picked it up from the jeweler that day and was planning on proposing next time I saw her. It was, it was pretty ironic. Um, but how much different would that conversation have gone? How much different would Catherine's experience of that conversation have gone if she were holding it and not me? if she had the down payment of a future promise. Now, that wouldn't mean that we were married yet, but she would have had something she could hold on to that promised a future marriage. And now, I am an imperfect man, and so my promises only carry so much weight. But God is perfect. He has never once broken his promise. And if he has given you 
his down payment, his seal and sign, you will receive the promise. You will be in heaven for eternity. And God will treat you as, as fully loved as he loves you today for all eternity. All right, so first point, early withdrawal restriction. Second point, uh, first installment, right? Third point, our inheritance brings glory to God. In verse 11 and 14, Paul re- repeats a phrase that our inheritance is to the praise of his glory, of God's glory. Our inheritance is to the praise of God's glory. This means that God giving us this inheritance celebrates God's glory. God is not giving us his inheritance begrudgingly. He delights to do so. We can relate to this as humans to some much smaller experience. We like giving good things to people who we care about. There's a rule of etiquette I've heard that if you're at someone's home and they offer you a drink, of, of, of some kind of something to drink, you're supposed to say yes, even if you're not thirsty. Just ask for a cup of water and take a sip. Because people like giving good things to people they care about. It's a blessing to them. And it's so much more with God. He loves giving good gifts to his people. A number of years ago, again, college ministry story, I was at this, this conference with some of my students, and there was this song playing. And it, I'm not super into contemporary Christian music, uh, but this song was a good song. Um, and and the, the chorus of the song was, Oh, how he loves us. Oh, how he loves us. And it was repeated. Probably way too much repetition, but um, it was repeated. And as we were singing the song, I saw a couple of students of mine stand up and leave the room. And they looked disgruntled. Um, so I followed them out. And if you don't know this about college students, college students love being righteously upset about things. <laughs> and Presbyterians love being righteously upset about things. That's why General Assembly is going to be interesting sometimes. Uh, but Presbyterian college students love being righteously upset about things. So I followed them out and I said, hey, what's going on? Uh, why, why, are you, why do you look so upset? And they said, we shouldn't be singing these songs about how much God loves us as if we're the center of the universe. We should be singing about how much we love God. And I love the sentiment, but what I wish I'd been able to explain to them there is seeing about how much God loves us is celebrating God's glory. Because he, his glory is shown most magnificently in the cross of Jesus in giving us grace and adopting us as his children. And as we move to conclusion here, it's important to note that not only does the Father love giving you an inheritance, God the Son loves sharing his inheritance with you. Not only does God the Father love giving you an inheritance, God the Son loves sharing his inheritance with you. As in all families, the inheritance comes from the parents to the children. Um, And so God the Father loves giving his inheritance. Uh, But though we are adopted children of God, Jesus Christ is the only begotten Son of God. Now, that doesn't mean there was ever a time in which God the Father exists and, and God the Son didn't exist. They are co-eternal and share, co- they, they, they share glory and substance, and they've both existed for all eternity. But they have existed for all eternity in the relationship as a father of a son. And that is mysterious and confusing, but it's true. And so what we receive as an inheritance, as adopted children of God, God the Son has as his birthright, in a sense. And he's sharing it with us. I'm sure you're familiar with the story of the prodigal son, right? The story of uh, the younger brother, his two brothers, his younger brother takes his inheritance early, he leaves and he wastes it, and he comes back and throws himself at the mercy of his father, and his father doesn't just um, make sure he doesn't starve, his father re-puts him in the family and re-establishes him as a full son in the family. And there's a big party, and the older son doesn't go to the party. The father goes out to the older son and says, hey, come in, let's celebrate. And the older son is furious. He won't go in. He's so upset. And maybe, maybe part of the reason he's upset is he's realizing what welcoming the younger son is going to do to him. Remember, in order to be a full son in a family, you have to be a sharer of the inheritance. If not, you're not really truly a son. It's just sentiment, right? It's not legal. And so... The older son realizes this guy's already spent his inheritance. If he's back in the family, that means he has an inheritance. And that means he's getting some that was supposed to come to me. 
right? So maybe this is what he's thinking. This, the text doesn't make it perfectly clear. But if this is the case, he does not want to share with the younger brother. And the story ends with him out, outside the party uh, while the family celebrates inside. Well, Jesus Christ is a much, much better older brother to us than the prodigal son's older brother was to him. Because though we had no inheritance that was rightfully ours, Jesus delighted to share it with us. Not in the sense that there was sort of some sort of uh, definite value of the amount of glory he had. And if he gives us some, he's somehow less glorious. No, there is an infinite amount of glory. Jesus' glory is not diminished by sharing his glory with us. But in order to share his glory with us, it came at great cost to himself. He had to suffer. He had to die. He had to be punished for our sin in order to let us into the family. And it came at great cost to him. But the book of Hebrews tells us he did it out of joy for the joy that was set before him to share this inheritance with us. So if you are a follower of Jesus, you are a partaker in this glorious inheritance that the Father is delighting to give you, the Son is delighting to share with you. It's important to note, though, that inheritance is only given to those who are members of the family. And so if you have not yet been welcomed into God's family by accepting the gift that Christ has offered you in the cross, I would encourage you, do that. The door is open. The way is available to come in and be a son or a daughter of God. But if you have received Christ, let us rejoice in our inheritance and let us praise the one who shared it with us. Let us not fall into the trap of either an over- or an under-realized eschatology. Rather, let us enjoy the blessings of our salvation today as we await the time when we will come into full possession of it. I will pray for us briefly, and then we will respond in worship through the song of thanksgiving. Father God, thank you for this church, for the way that they love you and serve you. Uh, We pray that you would bless this church mightily and help them to remember the incredible love that you have for them. In the name we pray. Amen.